Apple just released a bunch of information about how Apple intelligence works. And there's a lot of confusion about it. A lot of people think that they are just offloading everything to OpenAI, but that's not the case. Apple actually has a lot of really cool, innovative artificial intelligence that they have built themselves. And a lot of it can actually run directly on your device. So I'm going to go through all of the details that they've published so far today. So let's get into it. So here's, I guess, what they call a research paper. It's found on machinelearning.apple.com slash research, introducing Apple's on-device and server foundation models. So apparently they have made multiple models, but in this paper, they're going to be talking about two mainly the 3 billion parameter model that can run on your phone and then the server-based model, the cloud-based model that can't run on your phone and they offload to when necessary. And I'll get into all these details in a moment. So they start off by saying that they introduced Apple Intelligence, a personal intelligence system integrated deeply into the iOS, iPad OS, and Mac OS. And I think the personal intelligence system is the key differentiator for Apple. Apple has access to a ton of personal information because they are your device for the most part. Obviously, if you're Android, it's similar, but for Google. And they built their models knowing that that is their superpower. They didn't try to compete with OpenAI and other frontier models on world knowledge. World knowledge being defined as if you needed to ask questions about the world. What's the capital of California? Tell me about the fall of Rome and so on. Basically, any questions about the world that aren't actually questions about yourself. And so they really leaned into that. And I think that was a great call. So Apple intelligence is comprised of multiple highly capable generative models that are specialized for our users everyday tasks. And I'm going to continue to emphasize how important this truly is personal and everyday tasks. Apple's AI is going to accomplish things for you. And that is the key. That is why I'm so bullish on Apple, not investment advice, but I am so bullish on Apple because they have the ability with their closed ecosystem, with their access to all of your information or a lot of your information to actually accomplish things for you. And when I'm thinking about the world model approach that OpenAI and ChatGPT are taking versus the very personal, small model, but I'm going to actually accomplish things for you approach. I think I'll probably use the world model a few times a day, maybe, but Siri accomplishing actual tasks for me in my day-to-day -day life, I'm going to be using that all day, every day. And that is what has excited me so much about agentic frameworks like Crew AI. Those types of systems promise to actually accomplish real valuable tasks for you. The foundation models built into Apple intelligence have been fine tuned for user experiences such as writing and refining text. So we saw demos of that prioritizing and summarizing notifications. I said this in my WWDC review video, but it seems like this should have been around for a long time. Prioritizing and summarizing notifications seems like a really easy problem to solve and something that I thought already existed and creating playful images for conversations with family and friends and taking, here's the most important part, in-app actions to simplify interactions across apps. That to me is the first step in the most important path that Apple is taking in artificial intelligence. Now, going back to creating playful images, they really took a very conservative approach with their AI in general. And understandably so. Apple is extremely protective of their brand. If somebody were to jailbreak their diffusion model and actually produce images that were of sensitive nature or get Siri to talk about something that is also sensitive in nature, it would look really bad for Apple and they are hyper protective about that brand. So they talk about two different models and two of the multiple, but they say they're gonna release more information about the other one soon. Three billion parameter on device language model runs on your phone. Now I've already talked about this, Apple Silicon, the M1, M2, M3, M4, all of these chips and also what's found in your iPad, what's found in your MacBook Pro, these chips are incredible at running inference. And especially with the MLX framework, they run inference really fast. And in fact, that was my main inference machine, obviously until Dell sent me this beast of a machine with two RTX 6000s in it. And their cloud-based, their large server-based language model, which is available in what they're calling their private cloud compute and running on Apple Silicon servers. So their entire cluster 
from the phone all the way up to the cloud is running on Apple Silicon, have been built and adapted to perform specialized tasks efficiently, accurately, and responsibly. Great. These two foundation models are part of a larger family of generative models created by Apple to support users and developers. This includes a coding model, awesome, to build intelligence into Xcode, very welcome, as well as a diffusion model to help users express themselves visually, for example, in the Messages app. And they're gonna share more information about those soon. Now, a big part of this paper is talking about responsible AI development. And you already know if it's coming from Apple, it is gonna be highly censored. They are trying to put as tough of guardrails around the AI as possible. They do not want jailbreaking. They do not want you to create sensitive images or sensitive text with their models. And you're gonna see they really spent a lot of time trying to prevent it. Here they talk about their responsible AI principles. So let's dive into those. Empower users with intelligent tools. We identify areas where AI can be used responsibly to create tools for addressing specific user needs. So again, they are obviously taking the very verticalized approach to AI. They are not building a generalized world model. They are building very narrow, specific models for specific use cases. And I actually believe that architecture is gonna take us really far. When you can have all of these individual, highly efficient, low cost models running for specific use cases, they're gonna be great at that specific use case. And then if you have an orchestration layer that can actually choose the right model for the right use case, that is when magic happens. And if I were to bet, I would bet on that architecture over the generalized world model approach. But I think they're both incredible, just to be clear. I think ChatGPT is incredible. Next, represent our users. We build deeply personal products with the goal of representing users around the globe authentically. We work continuously to avoid perpetuating stereotypes and systemic biases across our AI tools and models. I'll just leave it at that. Nothing more to say. Design with care. We take precautions at every step at every stage of our process, including design, model training, feature development, and quality evaluation to identify how our AI tools may be misused or led to potential harm. We will continuously and proactively improve our AI tools with the help of user feedback. And then protect privacy. We protect our users' privacy with powerful on-device processing and groundbreaking infrastructure like private cloud compute. We do not use our users' private personal data or user interactions when training our foundation models. And they can get away with that because they're training small models for the most part. They're training very verticalized models. So let's walk through each step of the rollout of a new model under Apple's umbrella. So first the data, and they don't give a ton of information about the underlying data that they're using, a little bit, and I'll touch on that in a second. Then they do pre-processing, pre-training, post-training optimization, and then they roll it out. So let's go through it all. Pre-training. Our foundation models are trained on Apple's AX Learn framework and open source project we release in 2023. And if we click through, we can actually get the code right here. So open source. It builds on top of JAX and XLA, allows us to train the models with high efficiency and scalability on various training hardware and cloud platforms, including TPUs. It's kind of interesting to see TPUs here. A little history, Google is the owner of the TPU architecture and Jonathan Ross, the founder of Grok, G-R-O-Q Grok, the cloud inference service that has inference speeds much faster than anybody else, is the inventor of the TPU. So kind of interesting that they're using Google's product here. And both cloud and on-premise GPUs. We used a combination of data parallelism, tensor parallelism, sequence parallelism, and fully sharded data parallel to scale training along multiple dimensions such as data model and sequence length. Now let's talk about the data itself. We train our foundation models on licensed data including data selected to enhance specific features, as well as publicly available data collected by our web crawler, AppleBot. Web publishers have the option to opt out of the use of their web content for Apple intelligence training with a data usage control. Now, when I'm thinking about it, I think a lot more companies trust Apple, rightfully or not, with their data. And so if you're thinking as a web publisher, as a content producer, well, should I give my data to OpenAI or to Apple or neither? You're probably gonna lean towards Apple or neither, definitely not OpenAI. We never use our users' private personal data or user interactions when training, great. We apply filters to remove personally identifiable information like social security and credit card numbers that are publicly available on the internet. We also filter profanity and other low quality content to provide its inclusion in the training corpus. In addition to filtering, we perform data extraction, deduplication, and 
the application of model-based classifier to identify high quality documents. All right, then let's move on to post-training. We find that data quality is essential to model success. Yes, good data in, good data out. So we utilize a hybrid data strategy in our training pipeline, human annotated and synthetic data, and do thorough data curation and filtering. And they've developed two novel algorithms in post-training, a rejection sampling fine-tuning algorithm with teacher committee and reinforcement learning from human feedback algorithm with mirror descent policy optimization and a leave one out advantage estimator. I am not actually sure about the details of these algorithms, but I'm probably going to look into them soon. Next, optimization. In addition to ensuring our generative models are highly capable, we have used a range of innovative techniques to optimize them on device and on our private cloud for speed and efficiency. So it seems like Apple is really focused on those two things, speed and efficiency. And that makes sense. They probably want to push as much of the compute to the device as possible. That'll save them a lot of money. It'll increase people's privacy and security. And I'm just a big fan of running things locally. So both on-device and server models use group query attention, something that we've briefly talked about in previous videos. We use shared input and output vocab embedding tables to reduce memory requirements and inference costs. I wonder if they're using Gnomic AI's embedding model. That would be awesome because it is open source and it is really fast. The on-device model uses a vocab size of 49,000 and the server model is 100,000. On-device inference, we use low bit parallelization, a critical optimization technique that achieves the necessary memory power and performance requirements. And to maintain the quality, we developed a new framework using LoRa adapters that incorporates a mixed two bit and four bit configuration strategy, averaging 3.5 bits per weight to achieve the same accuracy. So yeah, I mean, they really, went cutting edge with their local models and I love it, I love it. So anybody who thought they were just completely outsourcing their AI strategy, you are wrong. They also used something that they invented called Telaria, which is an interactive model latency and power analysis tool, better guides the bitrate selection for each operation. So again, just another optimization tool. We also utilize activation quantization and embedding quantization and have developed an approach to enable efficient key value cache update on our neural engines. Very technical stuff. I am not gonna dive too deep into all of this. With this set of optimizations, iPhone 15 Pro, which is the minimum model that you're gonna have to actually run these models, we were able to reach time to first token latency of 0.6 milliseconds, 0.6 millisecond per prompt token. That is incredible. And a generation rate of 30 tokens per second, which is acceptable. And this performance is attained before employing token speculation techniques from which we see further enhancement on the token generation rate. All right, so let's talk about model adaptation. The models are fine-tuned for users' everyday activities and can dynamically specialize themselves on the fly for the task at hand. That is really cool, and that sure sounds like mixture of experts. We utilize adapters, small neural network modules that can be plugged into various layers of the pre-trained model to fine-tune our models for specific tasks. And I find this really interesting. So by fine tuning only the adapter layers, the original parameters of the base pre-trained model remain unchanged, preserving the general knowledge of the model while tailoring the adapter layers to support specific tasks. All right, now let's look at performance. When benchmarking our models, we focus on human evaluation as we find that these results are highly correlated to user experience in our products. Yes, automated benchmarks are not great for the actual experience that you have when you're using a model. So let's look at their benchmarks. So this is human satisfaction score on summarization feature benchmark, and they are comparing their on-device, Apple on-device model to the Phi 3 Mini, which is by Microsoft, a tiny, very performant model. Let's take a look. So for email, we have an 87.5% satisfaction rate versus 73% on Phi 3 Mini. Notification summarization, I believe this is. Very similar results here around the high 70s. And right here it says they used 750 responses carefully sampled for each use case. So that just tells you a little bit about how they actually ran these tests. And then in addition to evaluating the feature specific performance, which is what we just looked at, they also evaluate both the on-device and server models general capabilities. We utilize a comprehensive evaluation set of real-world prompts to test the general model capabilities. And some of those prompts include brainstorming, classification, closed question answering, coding, extraction, mathematical reasoning, open question answering, rewriting, safety, summarization, and writing. And they compare the models to Phi 3, Gemma, Mistral, and DBRX. 
and commercial models, GPT 3.5 Turbo and GPT 4 Turbo. So here we go. Apple on device, the blue means it is a win. Apple's model is a win versus that model. So we can see versus Gemma 2B, 62% win. Mistral, 46% win. Phi 3, 43, and Gemma 7B, 41. So pretty good. It did pretty good. Now Apple server, it looks like the only model they actually truly lost against is GPT-4 Turbo. Now let's talk about harmfulness. And as I mentioned, of course, Apple focused so much on safety. Now here is their on-device human evaluation of output harmfulness, much better than everything else, significantly better. And of course, harmfulness, another word for that could be censorship. And then look at the Apple server version versus the closed source frontier models, GPT 3.5 Turbo, GPT 4 Turbo, DBRX Instruct, and Mixtral 8x22B. Apple's harmfulness score is very low. Here's another graph with human preference evaluation on safety prompts. So again, Apple won. Then they also used instruction following eval benchmark to compare their obedience, basically. And we can see once again, Apple won on the on device and Apple came in second place just barely to GPT-4 Turbo. Here's the writing benchmarks. So on device, they compared it again to small models, Apple one, but pretty close. Writing is something that all models do really well. And same with the server version. So Apple one, except for GPT-4 Turbo, but all of them are pretty similar. So that's it. I'm really excited to actually try it out. I upgraded to iOS 18 in the hopes that maybe I would get a little preview of some of this stuff, but it's not out yet. I think that the approach of having a very small model that is run locally on your device and you can run inference on it and it's actually fine tuned to help you accomplish tasks, that is the future. And I love the approach that Apple took. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving a like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next one.